All right. Good morning or good evening, depending where you're where you're at today. Um, welcome to today's lecture series as part of the Sustainability Council uh, joint lecture between the University of Alberta and RWTH Aachen University. My name is Andrew and my pronouns are he and him. I work at the Sustainability Council here at the University of Alberta. Today, we will hear from Dr. Karen Lee. And first, I would like to start with a treaty acknowledgement. The University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory. This land is the ancestral space of the Papatese Cree and Métis Nation and the traditional territory of Blackfoot, Cree, Dene, Stony Nakoda, Anishabe, and many other Indigenous peoples whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. As a settler, I continue to reflect on what it means to live, work, and play on Treaty 6 territory, and I'm honoured to continue growing my knowledge and understanding of these important histories and how I can honour the gifts of these lands. The Sustainability Council works with all faculties at our university to spark learning, discovery, and citizenship for sustainability. We offer courses and experiential learning, opportunities for students, support sustainability-related research, put on sustainability awareness events, and engage with the broader community on sustainability initiatives. This lecture series is a joint partnership between the University of Alberta here in Edmonton and RWTH Aachen University in Germany. Eduardo Jimenez is here to speak more about that partnership between our two universities. Thank you, Andrew, for having me here. Uh, good morning, good evening, everyone. Before we start today's lecture, I'd like to just very, very briefly describe the uh, University of Alberta and RWTH um, Aachen partnership. This dynamic collaboration um, between our institutions started in 2017. Our alliance spans a diverse spectrum of uh, disciplines, fostering innovation and academic excellence. At the heart of the uh, partnerships are numerous uh, joint research projects and programs uh, integrating our um, expertise of both institutions. There are a few programs established by the partnership. For example, an undergraduate student can embark on a transformative research experience through the uh, UR or Europe International Fellowships, um, while graduate or PhD students uh, can pursue their academic ambitions through the, ju uh, the Junior Research uh, Fellowship. Postdoctoral researchers can uh, further enrich their careers with the Senior Research Fellowship, uh, offering a platform for advanced exploration and collaboration. Sustainability uh, takes a uh, center stage as a core theme of the U uh, of A and RWTH Agon Partnership, reflecting on a shared commitment to addressing global challenges uh, this collaborative effort not only enhances the academic landscape of both institutions, but also contributes to the broader um, goal of creating a sustainable and impactful future. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending this lecture. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the uh, U of A and Aachen Partnership, please reach out. Now, back to you, Andrea. Thank you so much, Eduardo. Um, so we will hold a Q&A session after this presentation, so please feel free, free to throw any questions you have in the chat. Um, I'll also put a link to our website where you can see all our future lectures as well. Um, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Karen Lee. Dr. Karen Lee is an Associate Professor at the Division of Preventative Medicine at the Department of Medicine at the University of Alberta. In 2017, the Canadian Institute of Planners awarded Dr. Lee its President's Award for her significant contributions to integrating health into municipal planning in Canadian communities and globally. Prior to returning to Canada, Dr. Lee was in the U.S. for a decade and a half and worked at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta and the New York City Health Department. One of her projects was creating a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring network for the healthy community environments involving 15 U.S. communities. Since returning to Canada in 2018, in addition to her academic role as Associate Professor, Dr. Lee is also a part-time Medical Officer of Health with Alberta Health Services Provincial Public and Population Health. As the Director for the Housing for Health Project at the University of Alberta, she has worked with more than 250 multi-sector partners from six provinces in Canada. Project successes have included publication of the Healthy Community Guidelines. She is also the author of the book, Fit Cities, published by Penguin Random House. 
thank you so much for being here, Dr. Lee, and I will pass it over to you. Thank you so much to Andrew and the Council for inviting me uh, to this lecture series. Um, and with that, I'm going to get started. Um, we should be presenting for about 40 to 45 minutes and leaving about 15 to 20 minutes at the end for Q&A. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone see this? Um, Andrew, do let me know if it's uh, not uh, not uh, showing up. This slide anyway. is good. Okay, fantastic. So I work um, primarily in looking at how we can improve health outcomes through uh, our community environments. And um, as we talk about how to improve health outcomes, um, uh, many times that synergizes actually with sustainability outcomes that we need to achieve in our communities as well. Uh, we've recently, through partnerships with um, over 150 sect uh, multi-sector partners in Canada across multiple provinces, many of them here in Alberta, uh, we actually have released these healthy community guidelines. I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about them and about um, thinking through this lens of both health and sustainability synergistically. I'm trying to advance my slides and it's not advancing, so... Okay, um, I might have to redo the slideshow again. Let's see. Okay, now it's working. Um, public health um, priorities have changed over time. For example, in the 19th and early 20th centuries, we were primarily plagued by um, infectious diseases, safety issues, maternal and infant mortality, and reproductive health. And, you know, one of the major ways in which we actually addressed this was through how we thought about our environments, right? The whole sanitation movement um, in European and North American cities were really crucial to um, having clean water, um, you know, uh, addressing um, issues that were um, primary, um, Sorry, it's like this thing has shown up. Um, primary um, uh, environments that that um, influenced uh, the uh, transmission of um, infectious diseases. I know we've just been coming out of a COVID pandemic and are still in many cases impacted by its various waves. But if you look at the 20th century, uh, late 20th century and 21st century issues, they are now issues like chronic diseases with their risk factors like obesity that is rising globally, including in developing nations. We have aging populations globally. We have mental health issues. Um, clearly climate change and environmental pollution are key issues. And we're seeing climate disasters and extreme weather conditions now very, very regularly across the globe. Of course, we still have emerging issues like COVID-19 and preventable injuries. But, you know, the infectious disease issues that we face today often are impacted by climate change patterns, um, by also um, underlying heart, large burdens of chronic diseases like heart diseases, lung diseases, um, diabetes. And these in turn impact, for example, the, the severe, the severity and mortality that can occur from infectious diseases like COVID-19 and even annual influenza. So, you know, there are very high burdens of these illnesses now, both in Canada and elsewhere. 44% of Canadians aged 20 and over have at least one common chronic condition. Um, one in four are impacted by high blood pressure diseases of the joint, mental health issues like mood and anxiety disorders, um, diabetes. Uh, we often know that lung disease like asthma and pulmonary disease are greatly impacted by issues like air pollution, but actually so are things like heart disease, um, cancers, um, and um, increasingly we're of course with aging populations also seeing rising rates of dementia. But this, as I said, is not um, unique to 
uh, Canada or just the developed world, in the developing world and in lower income countries, we're also seeing transitions from infectious diseases being main causes of mortality to these non-communicable diseases like heart disease and strokes, cancers, diabetes, and chronic lung disease um, now being the leading causes of death. So over 74% of deaths, over 40 million deaths annually. And as I mentioned, this is also contributing to such large burdens of underlying chronic diseases um, are impacting the severity and mortality that we're seeing from, for example, arising infectious diseases like COVID. Um, so leading risk factors are shared amongst many of these diseases. So the reason I don't highlight tobacco and harmful use of alcohol is that in many jurisdictions in North America and in Europe, we've done a lot actually to address issues like tobacco, the you know, um, Indoor Air Acts have often banned tobacco from indoor spaces um, and the uh, impacts of tobacco smoke from indoor spaces, um, for example. Many of our jurisdictions have regulations that actually regulate how alcohol is sold, who it can be sold to, where it can be sold, etc. But in terms of some of these other issues like physical inactivity, unhealthy diets, high blood pressure, overweight, obesity, um, cholesterol, high blood sugars that then contribute to diabetes, um, particularly this whole area of inactivity and unhealthy diets that then contribute to these other risk conditions have yet to be, I think, as systematically addressed, um, particularly from an environmental lens um, as they could be. What we know is that um, taking an environmental approach to these types of diseases have seen great successes in um, other jurisdictions. So I used to work for the New York City Health Department uh, and I was in New York City for um, over a decade uh, during the Bloomberg administration. And through these concerted efforts to actually improve our environments for improving these chronic diseases, what we found were um, I think astronomical gains and impacts that I think even exceeded our own expectations. So for example, decades long obesity trends showing childhood obesity rising rapidly uh, over the last few decades were actually reversed in the <clears throat> timelines of approximately one decade or less with these concerted efforts. And we didn't just see that in New York, but also in uh, mentoring cities, mentee cities uh, that we worked with, like Philadelphia and San Diego. Um, bicycle travel um, increased significantly compared with traffic fatalities, which concurrently decreased. Um, so um, having no physical activity at all um, significantly declined after functionally seeing no change in the previous decade, we even managed to improve life expectancies uh, in cities like New York so that it was increasing faster than the rest of the US. Um, in more pedestrianized areas, uh, we were able to do studies to measure air quality and were able to actually show air quality improving. Um, and then on top of it, there were economic benefits such as improved retail sales and decreasing retail vacancies in the areas that had improved pedestrianization efforts, uh, bicycling infrastructure efforts, and uh, transit uh, access efforts. So one of the things that I uh, previously worked on as well when I was in New York uh, was this designed to move active cities guide. And what we found was that you know, in the attempts to create healthier cities, there are actually a whole host of studies that show not only does health improve, but we can actually see improvements to a myriad of other co-benefits, including environmental, economic safety, and social benefits. So here are some examples of health benefits that uh, have been shown in studies, uh, existing studies. Living near green spaces can decrease the odds of stress by 30%. Um, you know, uh, mental health issues can improve from regular physical activity, such as regular walking. Um, you know, even simple stair use in our um, in our buildings uh, can impact all-cause mortality. 
and uh, also regular weight gains that we're seeing annually in adults. Environmental benefits, though, are also there. So, for example, um, investments in sidewalks uh, not only return health benefits, but air quality benefits that exceed construction costs. Uh, public transportation um, can produce 95% less carbon monoxide than cars. Um, you know, with bus rapid transit improvements, you could see massive reduction in, for example, again, air pollution. And I think we think a lot about, I think, active transportation as it relates to uh, both health and environmental issues. However, I think if we were to think a little bit more deeply about additional co-benefits and synergies, um, you know, uh, the reliance on elevators is a reliance on an electricity using device. Um, I've read statistics that show that, you know, if you leave an escalator running 24 hours, seven hours, seven days a week, you can generate something like four, four car loads of carbon dioxide every year. So yes, we do need elevators for accessibility uh, and for those who cannot use the stairs, but um, promoting stair use amongst those who are able-bodied is both good for their health and potentially has benefits too for the environment. Active recreation rather than television usage. So when I was in New York, I remember going to a conference on environmental conservation. And the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation um, showed uh, their projected modeling at the time, and this was a while back, showing that households in New York State were anticipated to very soon overtake, um, have uh, TVs uh, overtake uh, refrigerators as the main sources of household appliance energy use. So wherever we can actually encourage people to not sit on their uh, sit at home watching TVs, but to turn off those televisions. Um, and potentially that could concurrently be matched with turning off things like air conditioning during very hot uh, summer weather um, and getting out or going out to recreation facilities and um, undertaking activities that are more social as well as physically active could have actually concurrent benefits as well. Safe tap water. Um, we often hear the uh, arguments against bottled water, but if you actually think about highly sugared beverages, they often also come bottled and canned, and uh, I suspect have even higher transportation miles uh, in terms of ingredients uh, than bottled water. And so the movement to protecting our tap water and promoting its use as opposed to bottled and canned beverages and you know, if you think about healthy foods like fruits and vegetables, they actually generate compostable waste uh, and unhealthy foods like highly processed foods, whether from a fast food outlet or the grocery store, usually comes with a high amount of packaging that goes into the landfill, as well as high amounts of transportation um, miles associated with um, the processing and shipment of its ingredients. <clears throat> Healthy communities, I think, that have these synergies for the environment don't have to cost more. So when I was in New York, we actually worked on creating various guidelines um, and found that, you know, integration of these guidelines into affordable housing, which has the tightest cost margins frequently, were actually very doable. And that um, the costs uh, were uh, nominal and very, very in, uh, significant compared to total development and construction costs. So in the order of 0.4% uh, or less, and in fact, in one of the case studies, we were actually able to show a cost savings from better design. <clears throat> Anyways, based on the successes of um, uh, my previous work and um, uh, <clears throat> partnerships in, um, the US, <clears throat> places like New York, uh, Philadelphia, San Diego, <clears throat> I was um, asked to, uh, I was invited to submit a grant proposal to the Public Health Agency of Canada for a Canadian project. And so 
um, we were able to uh, obtain this grant for a project called Housing for Health. And basically it built on five elements that we implemented previously in the United States uh, in places like New York. One was knowledge sharing that targeted a multi-sector audience. So very much like this lecture series. So um, that actually brought different audiences into conversation with each other and into looking for opportunities to work together. So we had, um, you know, Fit Cities and Fit Towns conferences in 2021, 2022, and 2023. And it was slightly delayed because the initial conference um, had to be delayed when um, COVID struck us. Um, we also had a whole area of community engagement where we had workshops and events targeting community residents so that they would be more engaged in talking about creating healthier and more sustainable environments together. This is a really important piece of generating industry demand and also political supports. Um, pilot housing developments. So we used pilot projects, not as a be all and end all, but as a way to demonstrate that, you know, the initiatives we wanted to undertake in our buildings, our sites and our neighborhoods in different types of housing developments and different types of neighborhoods were indeed uh, possible and feasible in the Canadian context. So Edmonton has a population of about 1 million and we chose there an affordable housing project um, in Leduc, which is in the suburbs of Edmonton. Um, so it's a more suburban uh, type of environment uh, with, with a population of about 35,000. We chose a mixed income housing project. And in White Court, which is a small town of about 10,000, about two hours northwest of Edmonton, we chose a market rate housing development that had um, independent living, supportive living, and also dementia care on different floors. So by doing that, we were able to demonstrate that the feasibility of these strategies occurring in different sizes of municipalities, different types of municipalities, but also different types of uh, housing projects. And then partnerships were an extremely critical uh, part of the successes that we were able to build. Um, so we had partnerships for the pilot housing developments. Based on the strategies that were in those developments, we were then able to use those lessons um, and overlay upon them um, evidence from the science to create two sets of guidelines, the healthy community guidelines, which I'm going to talk to you about, and the healthier food and beverage guidelines for public events. And then, of course, we're undertaking research and evaluation of all of these components. Um, um, I think Andrew is going to share the um, my slides, and you'll have links to the available publications. Uh, if you go to uh, www.uab.ca slash H4H, you can get all these resources. And we're also posting publications from peer-reviewed journals as they occur, the links to them uh, on the website. So www.uab.ca slash H number 4H. So pilot housing developments, as I said, was a, a critical part of demonstrating feasibility in different contexts in, um, in the Canadian context. The Housing for Health team worked with uh, development and architecture teams. So you, to demonstrate also the, 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 um, the uh, <clears throat> need and possibilities uh, from uh, multi-sector partnerships because the building and site scales required that. Uh, but then we worked with the towns and cities themselves on healthy design and amen amenity features to occur in the neighborhoods. Some examples of the types of uh, interventions included uh, focusing on trying to improve stairwells in such a way that they would improve use of the stairwells over the elevator. Um, simple things like um, improving the visibility of the stairwell, the accessibility of it, because in Canada, for example, there are many buildings with locked stairwells that are only meant to be used uh, not for every day, but for um, <clears throat> fire and other emergencies. Um, studies have shown that, you know, um, uh, having natural lighting, having art and music uh, can be uh, 
very important in improving stairwells uh, for uh, encouraging use. Simple signage uh, at points of decision, like outside of stairwells and at elevator lobbies. Uh, walking maps that actually uh, show people that there are nearby healthy amenities they can walk to. Uh, things that you can do on the site from walking trails and paths to gardening boxes and amenities. And, um, you know, working with the towns and cities on the neighborhoods around these um, sites for walkability. So, for example, longer pedestrian crossing lights for seniors populations who might be living in these, who are living in these um, developments, uh, putting more benches along routes to important amenities like grocery stores, neighborhood parks, the public library um, are amongst the types of things that we undertook. Interestingly, as we um, worked on these initiatives, we had this um, multi-sector partnership of over 250 partners in Canada, who we would bring together both in person and virtually over the course of the project. And as we shared some of the things that we were doing in the pilot development, we actually heard many of these partners saying they would like to do more on their projects too. And could we be sharing the strategies, which of course we did. But the strategies themselves were specific, of course, to these three developments. And so we embarked on a process with interested partners. And in the end, over 150 of the 250 partners joined us in this process in a committee to create a set of healthy community guidelines with the most up-to-date evidence that could be used um, across Canadian provinces. And what we've seen actually is there's been downloads of these guidelines actually internationally as well, um, as I'll share a little bit later. So these are available in English and in French, the two um, um, official languages in Canada. Uh, and these strategies include strategies to support healthier neighborhoods, sites, and buildings. And you, know, you can either find this by going to the previous URL or directly to this page. It's www.uab.ca slash HCG. So the goal is to improve um, supports for physical activity, healthy eating through healthier food and beverage access and social connections uh, in our neighborhoods, streets, sites, and buildings. And so the goal is to improve these three major protective factors um, while synergistically improving things like our environment, access for people with disabilities, um, access for different sociocultural groups and ethnic groups. Um, and those lenses were very important ones as well. It uh, is a set of guidelines that is not only evidence-based, but we actually worked with multi-sector partners and people who were practicing in planning, develop, development, uh, design and architecture, uh, who were in the construction industry, um, and uh, to be involved in giving a feasibility and practicality lens to the guidelines. So it has many target audiences from officials and policymakers to those undertaking planning and development or maintaining facilities uh, to even health and community residents interested in these issues um, who can use the guidelines as a lens for giving inputs into community projects uh, that they may become involved with. Because we had so many people, we ended up actually breaking our um, committee of over 150 into seven subgroups. So the first four, neighborhoods and streets, buildings and interiors, healthy food environments and social connections, as you could see, dealt with the content of the work. But we also wanted to ensure that uh, important lenses uh, for feasibility and for ensuring the strategies included um, any any vulnerable groups were also included. So we had rural and small municipalities as a working group. We had indigenous health and well-being working group. And we also had a people of all abilities working group that encompassed, you know, folks from the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, uh, organizations representing people with movement and spinal disabilities, with invisible disabilities like auditory or um, cognitive disabilities, et cetera. And we intentionally included these lenses 
um, and incorporated them into the strategies. So as I mentioned, both practice-informed and evidence-based, and uh, because of the numbers of strategies in the guidelines, over 100 of them, we actually used a, fo um, a focused review um, that uh, looked for moderate to high-quality systematic reviews. So we were looking for the evidence-based based on um, uh, multiple um, strategies that had multiple uh, studies already done on them. Um, so there's these three levels of evidence. You will see if you've checked out these guidelines or if you check them out, that there are strategies that have citations, but none of these um, symbols. So if you don't have a star, meaning there's mixed or inconclusive evidence, or there's not actually a symbol after it, so there might be one or two primary studies, perhaps, or gray literature. Those are uh, those are the strategies that if a if a uh, project was using them, they should be partnering with researchers, and researchers in turn should be looking for those strategies uh, to partner on uh, because those are strategies that need more um, um, research and evaluation uh, in order to synthesize the next round of evidence. So here are some examples. So um, the blue and green stars relate to physical activity. The brown stars relate to um, <clears throat> relate to medical conditions. The um, orange stars relate to healthy eating and the pink stars relate to social connections. So examples of strategies that you know have a myriad of evidence include ensuring healthy mixed use occurring uh, in our communities. Um, and the mixed use should be promoting physical activity and or social connections. So for example, having active transportation, which are also sustainable transportation amenities, like pedestrian, cycling, and public transit infrastructure that ensures residential areas are connected to communities, community amenities, and that that includes consideration for people of all abilities. Food retail that is healthy and carries, for example, produce uh, and other healthy foods and beverages. Um, continuity of sidewalks and pedestrian paths such that they connect to each other and lead to destinations with gridded or modified grid patterns on small block sizes. Um, active recreation spaces uh, that um, improve uh, under, that can take underutilized public and private spaces and repurpose them to these socialization and active physical activity spaces. Uh, and then thinking about cultural appropriateness of such uh, spaces as well uh, for different ethnographic groups and sociocultural groups that may be living in the neighborhood. On site themselves, thinking about building setbacks. So these are just examples. There are many more strategies uh, in the guidelines themselves. So I'd encourage you to please download your free e-copy. For those interested in a hard copy, the University of Alberta Bookstore uh, does sell them. Um, but there are free copies that you can um, request off the off our website as well. So on-site includes building setbacks that are minimized uh, such that transparency is maximized between street and ground floor building interiors, um, pedestrian lights. Um, so I think in Europe, it's probably more common than in here, but in Edmonton and many Canadian cities, you actually find a lot of lighting on the streets are for the car. And there's actually no pedestrian scale lighting on many of our streets. Um, gardening spaces um, that actually accommodate uh, different ages and different abilities. Um, signage, uh, wayfinding signage that can guide pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, to healthy destinations in the neighborhood. Uh, in terms of the building, the building itself also play, plays roles in promoting, um, you know, pedestrianization um, uh, and cycling um, for purposes of health and sustainability. So, uh, you know, what amenities you put into your ground floor matter. Uh, how your facade is designed matters. Um, 
incorporating crime prevention through environmental design principles, um, including lighting, um, certain types of buildings like school buildings um, need to ensure that they have amenities for uh, physical education and sufficient amounts of it, and also daily recess. Biophilic and greening elements, um, which can have both a uh, promotion uh, uh, for um, physical activity and walking, uh, which are uh, and then, of course, you know, porosity of, of, of green elements can actually help with, uh, with environment as well, in addition to the pedestrianization and the walking. And then thinking about roof spaces uh, that can be used for a variety of uh, healthy activities. Uh, and then, of course, I've mentioned already things like just um, ensuring that the stair is um, usable, but also pleasant to use uh, and uh, for, for building users. So how can we use the Healthy Community Guidelines? Well, there's an opportunity for everyone to use it in different ways. Um, institutions and governments, so including, you know, university institutions, can be case examples of things that need to change in our buildings, on our campuses, on our sites and neighborhoods. And so we can routinely be incorporating the Healthy Community Guidelines into our policies and projects. So if there is a renovation project, if there is an expansion project of campuses, um, we could be case studies of what can be done in other parts of society. The planners, architects, designers, developers, and buildings that we work with should routinely use these strategies. Facility operators, including ourselves, can make feasible retrofits. So some of them do not have to be expensive, like the signage that we've discovered, the walking maps. Um, health and community organizations um, and community residents uh, that are interested in this can use it for giving their lens, a health lens, including a sustainable lens for inputs to building and community projects. And then researchers, and students who are working on research can focus their strategies on strategies without consistent evidence, without STARS. Now, we were funded by um, Public Health Agency of Canada to look at improving three major outcomes of physical activity, healthy eating, and social connections. I've talked about how those have synergies with and co-benefits with the environment and environmental sustainability. But, you know, it would be great if... Uh, um, there were uh, environmental sustainability researchers or students working on research who wanted to do an overlay of the sustainability co-benefits onto, um, onto the guidelines. So, so far, um, we released them in um, the summer of this year. Um, and um, I wasn't able to get updated numbers uh, before this presentation this morning. Um, but as of the end of October, we'd had over 500 downloads. Uh, most of them are in Canada, but as you can see, um, there are international downloads as well. Uh, by October, we hadn't had any downloads in Germany. So my hope is that uh, many of you um, who are uh, attending this conference today will also uh, take a look at the guidelines and see if it can be useful for you. Um, so as I said, this was up to October 30th, 2023, but you could see that different sectors from health to policy, to planning, to education and child services, to architecture, housing development, recreation and transportation have been downloading them. And we're getting folks who are working uh, at the urban, rural, suburban, regional, provincial, national, treaty lands and international levels. Dr. Just to mention, yeah. Reminder. Oh, sure. Thank you. And just to mention as well that the healthy community, healthier food and beverage guidelines. That's the other set of guidelines. Again, healthier foods, as I mentioned, can be associated with less landfill. Um, so there's been. This is also available. These came out in um, 2022. Uh, these are also available in appendix, one of the appendices uh, in the um, Healthy Community Guidelines. Um, 
just to say a couple of other things to keep in mind is that, you know, uh, whenever a city or a town is improving or updating its master plans, and I would say that probably also applies to our institution. If we've got an institutional campus master plan, um, there are opportunities to integrate both health and sustainability priorities right into them. And so, for example, Edmonton's new city plan that came out in the end of 2020 um, identifies um, both health, a healthy city and climate resilience as two of its four key strategic goals. So um, there's opportunities to use that. And urban planning has a variety of tools and policy mechanisms from mandates like regulations, like zoning regulations to incentives um, the, and design standards and uh, removal of impediments that can be used and should be used uh, to promote strategies for both health and sustainability. And as you can see, many of these strategies can do both. Um, improve health and uh, sustainability. So lessons learned, cross-sector partnerships and partnership products are really important to move the field forward. Um, knowledge sharing through uh, cross-sector conferences and lecture series like the ones you have here. Um, and I would say that, you know, the university setting is a great one to have this, but reaching out outside of academia to the practice worlds and is also really important. Engaging community residents so that their voices are heard for political support and industry demand. Pilot projects that can demonstrate feasibility uh, of uh, implementation and then incorporating that into um, guidelines, for example, or standards that scale up across more projects and then research and evaluation such that we keep learning and we use also the available evidence-based. So just to show like, you know, um, there are uh, some studies we're already doing around partners, for example, and we were able to show that different sectors are motivated by different things. So for example, regarding healthy environments, um, public health professionals are very motivated, the ones in Canada, by the evidence base. Planning professionals tend to be, uh, at least in the Canadian juris uh, jurisdiction, more influenced by available uh, legislation, regulations, and codes, but they tend to take more responsibility uh, for including built environment features that are healthy in their work. Um, and then just to show that you are able to attract different sectors to your conferences uh, if you target them. Uh, in your invitations and in your um, promotion. Um, and then that, you know, even um, these one day or two day conferences have the ability to change people's practices and knowledge as they self-report. Um, and then uh, even two hour workshops that we conducted, we were able to change people's preferences for more walkable neighborhoods, um, you know, people's planned use of available amenities in the neighborhood, um, uh, et cetera. And I think with that, I have lots of people to thank. Uh, there are a whole host of resources. Uh, if you wanna read about the New York City work and work I've done globally outside of the Canadian context, there's also this Fit Cities book, and it goes through, you know, a lot of case studies uh, of how the work and the processes for getting the work done. Um, and a big thank you to our funder, the Public Health Agency, that made our project possible the last five years. Okay, and I think with that, I'm going to stop. Um, thank you so much, Andrew, for the, the time check. Um, and open it up for questions and comments. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I found it, I found it really informative. It's, it's always interesting to see the connections between environmental sustainability and social sustainability, um, and health. And I think that's probably an area that, um, we we could look more holistically moving forward with sustainability, um, research and knowledge. So, folks, please throw questions in the chat. Um, we do have time for a Q and A. 
um, and, and we'll try and get through every question that gets asked. Um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I guess I'll start with one. Um, so I was just curious if when you went from New York back to Edmonton, if you found that there was a difference in the way you could apply some of your guidelines, for example, um, like indoors, it would be pretty similar, but um, obviously our climate is very different. So how do you take that into account when you're promoting um, like walkable cities, for example? Yeah, so, you know, I um, when we created the Healthy Community Guidelines, for example, well, New York does have a winter, right? And some of the um, things that we had to do there were actually more challenging because New York, you know, um, if you look at Manhattan, it's all it's an island. And so there's nowhere uh, much left to expand beyond the island boundaries. Um, the other five boroughs, yeah, there were some opportunities. Uh, and so a lot of times you did have to focus on retrofits using available space that had already been utilized or uh, for something else, right? And so, but nevertheless, like for example, some of the ways in which we created pedestrianized plazas, like pedestrian plazas and places for people to walk to in the community and also to socially gather uh, was through spaces that seemed to have been designated for parking, but were underutilized, right? Uh, or they were designed in such a way that they weren't efficiently being used for both the parking and for the people. Um, you know, when we were busy creating bike lanes, I mean, we were very fortunate that the transportation and city planning commissioners during the Bloomberg years actually went to Europe to learn from great cycling European cities. And when they came back, they, you know, instead of putting the bike lanes, like we often see bike lanes in many Canadian cities placed precariously between the sidewalk and between the parked car, the parked car and the moving car. Um, you know, so when um, these commissioners came back, we started in New York to place the uh, sidewalk, uh, the bike, bike lane between the sidewalk and the parked car with a painted buffer between the parked car and the um, and the bicycle lane. So the parked car became the protector of the bicycle from the bike from the uh, car traffic, right? And so in that situation, you're neither taking away the parking, uh, but you're introducing functionally a protected bicycle lane for the uh, for the cyclists. Um, yeah. So I think that uh, there's also so I think that. Uh, uh, you know, there are there are things that can be adapted. And if I think some of the things we learned was if you can actually do it in a really built out city like New York City, you can actually do them in um, newer cities and cities that are less built out. Um, uh, yeah, I, I would say that um, the mentoring um, initiative that I mentioned that was funded by USCDC, uh, we were shocked, actually, in New York. Uh, so we got a grant uh, in New York that would allow other American cities to sign on to be mentees in a peer-to-peer -peer network mentoring initiative that we had that uh, we had gotten the grant for, and we had like cities and jurisdictions of that were very different signing on. So we had everything from like, you know, the large cities like Philadelphia and Boston and Miami, but we also actually had uh, Chicago, but we also had suburban places like Cook County around Chicago. We had a tribal nation in Oklahoma. And so so the what what that showed us was that, you know, regardless of the differences, there are things that can be done, even though they have to be adapted. Um, I think there are a couple of questions coming into the uh, chat box. So I'm going to read them and then attempt to answer them. What can you say are the core benefits of the healthy community guidelines from the lens of a construction engineer or project manager? Yeah, all right. Um, well, I would say that some of the core benefits are the economic ones. What we found, uh, for example, in New York, uh, um, when transportation uh, would actually initiate these changes, they actually did a pre and post of many of the 
of the projects. So the pre-post included physical activity outcomes like volumes of pedestrians, health outcomes like, you know, if there were measurements done of air pollution, changes or improvements in air pollution. But they also looked at economic outcomes. Uh, so when you introduced new bus rapid transit routes into a neighborhood or you improved the pedestrian uh, realm in the neighborhood or you improved bicycling infrastructure, what happened? And in many cases, we're able to show improved uh, economic outcomes like improved retail sales and de decreased retail vacancies. So for example, if you are a um, construction um, project working with clients, these are types of the things, these are some of the things that I think could be sold as potential economic benefits uh, for your client, the developer or the um, building owner or you know, uh, the commercial building site um, developer, et cetera. So I don't know if that fully answered Leonard's question, but Leonard, if you have more, you could put it in the chat box again. I'm gonna move on to the next question. Is that okay, Andrew? Or do you wanna read the questions? Yeah, okay. The next one is, is the research project on, still ongoing and is there room for members from construction engineering to join? Um, well, I would love to have a discussion with construction engineering, absolutely. Um, the project is coming to an end actually at the end of this month. What we're hoping is our legacy, uh, besides the three pilot projects demonstrating feasibility, is the healthy community guidelines that has had inputs from over 150 sector, uh, multi-sector partners in Canada. Uh, demonstrating, you know, feasibility and practice-based feasibility um, from these inputs. Um, so Ahmed, I would say if you're interested in that, reach out to me. I'm certainly interested in having conversations with you. And, um, and as you potentially undertake to use the guidelines, um, you know, if you need me to connect you with some of the pilot project architects or developers, et cetera, that can certainly be done. So hopefully, Ahmed, I answered your question. And if not, you can put a follow up in the uh, in the chat again. Okay, the next one is Colleen. As a resident of Edmonton, what do you see as next steps for the city? Uh, yeah, so the city has recently undertaken a new zoning bylaw renewal that just recently passed. That is great news. And that um, I believe we hadn't for decades, uh, you know, updated our zoning. Um, there is going to be more emphasis, I believe, on mixed use, on density that then, you know, supports the viability of mixed use. Um, but I would say it's fantastic that they've taken this change in, um, like, city plan, for example, has specifically in two of its four key strategic goals. It's identified climate resilience and it's identified um, health, a healthy city. I think we need to look for synergies wherever we can between those because then there'll be similar strategies that gives us both outcomes. We have to make sure, I think, that their goals are, are followed City of Edmonton follows those strategic goals, those four key strategic goals, including healthy city and environmental climate resilience with actual initiatives that they implement to get us there. So the goals are great, but if we're not actually implementing policies and practice change routinely, then it's not enough. So I think the zoning regulations are also great, but there's like, I don't think we should wait decades to keep improving the zoning regulations. I think there has to be more common and frequent cycles of that. One of the things that we did in New York under Mayor Bloomberg and Plan YC was we also created a list of indicators uh, that would be reported and that was mandated by council to be reported by the city every four years. And they included both health indicators as well as climate change uh, and climate resilience and sustainability indicators. And so the public, uh, it would be expected that the public would get this report every four years and keep future uh, councils and future mayors accountable to those outcomes um, over time. So I think Edmonton could learn from that and have 
key mandated indicators around these four strategic goals. They need to implement strategies, uh, renew uh, zoning bylaws, I would say on a more continual basis. So for example, one immediate thing that already comes to mind for me is it's great, we're gonna have more mixed use in the zoning bylaw renewals, but I think we actually need more done. And the next step of that is healthy mixed use. So as you can see, there's probably a quite a difference between having, you know, mixed use is, it could be having like an alcohol outlet, a convenience store and a fast food outlet. That could be a mixed use, but that's a, not a healthy mixed use versus if you had a grocery store, a community garden, a park, a public library, a school, that's a different type of mixed use. And so, um, I think the next, there are continual improvements that are needed for implementation and uh, around those four key strategic goals. Okay, if I didn't answer your question, please uh, write again. And then Alyssa, I see a lot of similarities with the Strong Towns movement, except with a little more emphasis on health. Do you share ideas, strategies with them? That is really interesting. Uh, if you could send me more information on the Strong Towns movement, that would be terrific. Um, so um, I would love to share this with them. And if you're involved in that, please do do that. But um, there's a lot of different movements, I think. And uh, we're just trying to share as much as we can. Um, you know, um, that has not specifically come up. Uh, none of the partners have said, you know, we need to link to the Strong Towns movement so far, uh, the 250 partners we, plus that we've been working with. But always happy to... Uh, expand the partnership for implementation. Um, so Alyssa, please do send me, uh, I, I'm going to put my email right into the uh, chat box at the end. Okay. And do we still have time, Andrew, for a couple more questions? Yeah. Yeah. You've still got some more time and I'll include your email in the uh, message I send out at the end of this with the link to the slides and everything too. So. Oh, great. Okay. That sounds good. That. And I just put it in the chat box too. Oh no, that's actually to Ahmed. So I'll just go to everyone because Ahmed was like, uh, I'd like to contact you. So yeah, all right, Andrew will uh, Andrew will send it out. Uh, I'll just put it here. And Andrew will send it out as well. Thank you, everyone. Uh, okay, I'm gonna go to Terry's question. With work from home and less time commuting, do you see more opportunity for people to focus on their health and connect with their community? Terry, I think that there's opportunities, there's both pros and cons, you know, um, because commuting, if commuting wasn't so focused, in, for example, in Edmonton, a lot of commuting is focused on the car. But if we were actually very focused on active commuting, um, you know, you can walk to work regularly, you could walk to your, um, you know, um, walk to work regularly, for example, there may be actually opportunities through active commuting to work for more physical activity and health opportunities. Uh, the working from home, this could also present other opportunities, like more opportunities to walk your child to school if there was a school nearby for your child, instead of just dropping them off uh, by car, for example. Uh, there may be opportunities to um, focus on healthier eating if you're making meals more at home. Um, I would say, though, that, um, you know, I think work, whether we work from home, whether we work from offices, those are patterns that do change over time. And so I think a really important piece is our home communities, as well as our office communities, i.e. the neighborhoods and buildings, should all, I think, be uh, working on improving um, their environment for to be more supportive of healthy and sustainable behaviors. Um, the next question, um, Nancy, you touched on the incorporation of the accessibility lens, which is fantastic. Can you expand more on accessibility for those with mobility challenges? Improve signage encouragement is fantastic, but doesn't apply. Yeah, there are some, um, I think wherever it's feasible, it's not always feasible, but wherever feasible, I would say we really need to think about the use of ramps as well and active mobility opportunities for people with disabilities because studies show that people with disabilities actually have fewer opportunities 
uh, to uh, be physically active. Um, so there are folks who they may not want to use the elevator, but if that's the only option, then they have to use the elevator, right? So wherever feasible incorporation of things like ramps, uh, our park spaces, our uh, even things like beaches uh, on our lakes and um, at our oceans, you know, there are accessibility mats that can be used. Our gyms, our recreation spaces can be more in integrating of uh, accessible equipment, even things like gardening boxes. Those that are low to the ground may not be usable by people who need elevated ones, uh, as some examples. Um, okay. And then I think uh, that's it for questions. And I, I think we're sure. also at the end of the time here. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Um, it looks like a link was shared for the strong towns in the chat. Um, if you're interested, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Alyssa. Uh, yes. Um, yes. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today. Um, I hope you found this lecture as informative as I did. Um, and thank you again, Dr. Lee, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, everyone.